Okay, we can begin now. Yeah, thank you. And uh, we are <coughs> starting our last lecture in this uh, mini course. And uh, I'll uh, continue now in the spirit of the first two lectures. So uh, I mean that the last lecture was almost completely dedicated to one particular case with many details. Uh, the last lecture will be far more sketchy. So I'll continue a sort of survey with uh, uh, almost no proofs, but uh, I will rather focus on uh, uh, some um, challenging problems that arise along the way. And uh, uh, I'll continue the streamline of the first two lectures. So uh, uh, anyway, the focus will be slightly different, as you will see on the next slide. So what do I mean? I'm talking about the image of road maps all the time. And uh, what is particularly interesting for me to know somehow whether uh, the um, image is large or small, informally. Uh, what's, uh, what can I say in more uh, precise terms? Well, if uh, the word map is surjective, well, it's nothing to uh, talk about. It's the image is large, as large as possible. It's the whole group. Well, sometimes the subjectivity is not known or does not hold. But according to the Borel dominance theorem, the map is dominant. This immediately gives us uh, that over the algebraically closed fields, all algebraically closed fields, the image is large in the following sense, that uh, any uh, given element, small g, can be represented as a product of at most two w values, where so g is g1 times g2, where each of g1, g2 lies in the image of w. Once again, this is true over algebraically closed fields. So what to do if we are in more complicated situation? Uh, then uh, uh, what uh, I want to say that we can consider what is written in the title, problems of warning type. This terminology looks a little bit strange because it comes from number theory. You know the famous uh, worrying problem in additive uh, number theory, uh, saying that any sufficiently large uh, positive integer can be represented as uh, sum of, uh, um, say, fi uh, fixed powers of integers. So in the same spirit, one can ask whether any given element can be represented as a product of certain amount of uh, W values. If, say, your W is a power word, and if your operation is addition, it's exactly a worrying problem. I think that this terminology was introduced by uh, Anar Shalev, or maybe by Michael Larson with Anar Shalev. Anyhow, it's uh, common slang uh, of the people working in this area. So in more, uh, con in more conventional terms, this means that we want to know the W width of a given group. So how many factors do we need to represent any given element of our group? Yeah. Here two is enough in this setup, but in general, uh, the situation is much worse. I remind you Tom's phenomenon, which we discussed earlier. Uh, 
This phenomenon consists in the following observation that when our base field is not algebraically closed, then this width uh, can be made as large as we wish. Uh, one has to analyze the proof of Tom's theorem, which I skipped. You should look either to the original paper of Tom or to our survey with Plutkin and Gordiev to make sure that indeed for a compact real group, this uh, number, this word width can be made as large as we wish. So the situation is bad in this sense that the image is small indeed. Tom's uh, phenomenon gives another description of smallness. It is inside any epsilon neighborhood of one, so it's small in Euclidean topology, but also in the sense of word width, uh, it is small. Roughly, uh, large image means small W width, that you need not too many factors to represent any element of our group. So let's uh, continue uh, our work in this direction. So we now understand that, well, over algebraically closed field, everything is fine. Over, say, the real field, not everything is bad, but the compact case is bad in this sense. But one can improve the situation if we restrict our attention to split groups. So for split groups, the situation is not that hopeless. Here, uh, we also observe what we called in one of the earlier lectures, negative positive results. What do I mean? Here is a more precise statement. So first, let me fix uh, terminology, fix our setup. So now our G is a split, simple, simply connected linear algebraic group defined over, well, an arbitrary field, not necessarily algebraically closed. We consider its groups, its group of rational points. Uh, here we have some technical difficulty that it's not necessarily simple. Uh, in almost all the cases, it's quasi-simple. What does it mean? That it is perfect, coincides with its derived subgroup, and after factoring out the center, it becomes uh, abstract simple groups. There are a very a small amount of exceptions. They are all listed here. Small finite groups of lead type. You see, I am already starting to fit into the framework of your workshop, which is uh, entitled Finite Groups of Lead Type. I'll speak about finite groups of Lead Type in a few minutes. But now I'm considering a more general setup. So, well, we have a quasi simple abstract group, and after factoring out the center, we get a simple abstract group. Uh, uh, and now, uh, sorry, I'll skip some. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we have to consider two different cases. Yeah, finite ground fields and infinite ground fields. And I'll start with finite ground fields. Well, here we also have Borel's dominance theorem, but it's even less meaningful than in the case where the ground field is local, so you reload the edic. Because what's dominant? Uh, well, you have as a risky open, dense subset as the image, but uh, what does it mean in the finite field case? Nothing, yeah? It uh, says nothing about uh, the question how large is the word image? So one has to use other tools to measure uh, the image and to say whether it's large or small. And uh, the width seems to be a reasonable measure for this size. 
Okay. Um, this is also a common approach uh, in the theory of word maps on finite groups. Many people working in the area uh, using this context. So our goal here is to look for results of the flavor of the Huey Larson Shalev theorem, uh, which was proved for real groups, uh, and says that uh, every element of G can be represented as a product of small number of W values, well provided uh, our group is sufficiently large in the sense of its Lyric. So this was proved uh, for real groups, but here we will discuss the case of finite uh, groups of Lie type, and I want to remind you uh, of the situation here, although you should know this maybe better than me because of uh, the preceding courses. So here, uh, when our G is split, we have uh, abstract simple groups, which are denoted by G of Q, Chevalier groups, but also we have some additional series. So if we have a connected, simple, simply connected linear algebraic group, when uh, we use the famous theorem of Lang, that our G is quasi-split. So it's not necessarily split. Split means that it has uh, a maximal torus uh, defined over K, maximal split torus. Uh, Quasi-split is slightly weaker. It has a, a Borel subgroup defined over the base field. Uh, but also in this case, we uh, know that there are twisted form of Chevalier groups. Sometimes people call them standard groups, because standard indeed uh, contributed very much to the study of this situation. And here are several twisted types. Uh, typical situation in the case of type A twisted is the case of unitary groups. Form. It's the most well-known and well-studied case. So here, once again, the groups of K points are quasi-simple abstract groups. So we can continue the study in the same spirit. Uh, there are several more exceptional cases, uh, the so-called Suzuki and Rhee groups. Uh, here the, their construction is slightly more sophisticated. Uh, we have to use not Frobenius, but informally some a square root of Frobenius, some other automorphism of the corresponding simple algebraic groups uh, to get a new uh, finite simple monobelian groups. And in the case of F4 or the field of two elements, we have to uh, add one more action. We have to consider the derived subgroup to get a simple group. But anyhow, we have three new series of simple groups. And that's almost everything if we add uh, the alternating groups AN, one more infinite series, and also 26 sporadic groups. According to the more almost common agreement, consensus, this is the full classification of finite simple groups, which most people consider as finished. There are several groups of people that work on the improvement of the proof, but for me, say, the story is finished. So I don't, do not want to go into classification issues. For me, these are all finite simple groups. Well, so what's the conclusion? That if we consider uh, some result on word maps, on finite simple groups, in fact, we uh, can restrict our attention to the groups of point of simple split or quasi-split algebraic group over finite field, up to small things, up to the center. 
it's not everything because well you have to consider alternating groups there are infinitely many of them and usually this is a separate story and also 26 sporadics well if you consider symptotic results you can forget about sporadics if you consider non-asymptotic setup you have to work hard sometimes very hard almost always you have to use computers to uh, uh, treat all sporadics. This may be a mess if you consider uh, really big sporadics. I have certain experience with this. Well, it's a mess, but um, I could say that in most questions, 26 sporadics are more easily doable than infinite series of groups of lead type over uh, characteristics two or three. My experience show that this is the most messy uh, amount of infinitely many cases. Well, let's go ahead and let's uh, uh, make a short survey. What's known for such groups? I told you about negative positive results. So the first theorem, I'll start with the negative part. So if we have a finite non-abelian simple groups and fix some invariant subset, invariant means invariant under conjugation or even more invariant under all automorphisms. You know, some finite non-abelian simple groups admit a larger group of automorphisms, not only inner ones. And we require that A contains one, one is in the image of all word maps. Then, surprisingly, we can construct a word. In fact, two letters are enough with very small image, with image exactly A. Say, so take a single conjugacy class, even a small one, a join one, and you can always get a word which may turn out to be extremely long, but anyhow, anyway, there is such a word with a very small image of the uh, relevant word map on our simple group G. It's Lobosky theorem, which is a sort of very negative result. And the second part is positive. In a symptotic sense, however, so if, if you have two disjoint words W1, W2, and if you have a decomposable word W, which is a product of such, then for sufficiently large quasi-simple group, the image of the corresponding word map contains all non-central elements. So it's, well, almost subjective in a sense. So in a sense, the word width here is almost as small as possible. So it's a sort of asymptotic positive result. So the situation is reminiscent of the finite of uh, the real group case. The second part is also a theorem of Huy larsen Schleff. So here, some history, so it's theorem of Lobotsky, 2014. So I mentioned here that you have inevitable, inevitable natural constraints, invariance of the image, and one is inside. So if you fix G and vary W, you get something negative. And earlier results were obtained by Kasabov and Nikolov and also by Michael Lev. Matthew Levy, sorry. Matthew Levy for some families of finite simple groups, not as general as a Lubotsky theory. But also the uh, papers are interesting in uh, their own right, and there are several ideas that can be developed further. Uh, a few words about the proof, because I was asked last time about eventual analogs for other algebraic systems, for the algebras, the proof is tricky indeed. So first of ingredient is one and a half generation theorem, which was proved independently by 
Guralik and Counter, and also by William Stein. So what does it mean that for a given non-abelian simple group and for any non-identity element, you can find the complement B such that together with A, uh, the pair AB generates G. It's an important ingredient in Lobotsky proof. And it allows him to uh, get some very interesting corollary. So I omit the details of the proof that it implies that there exists a word such that for every pair of elements of our group, we can distinguish generating pairs from non-degenerating pairs by looking at W values, say, this particular Lubosky word, once again, it may be extremely difficult to uh, find it, but it exists, that there is such word which allows us to distinguish between generating pairs and non-generating pairs. It's a very interesting group theoretic consequence. Um, another remark that this negative results uh, is in a sense related uh, with the positive one. What do I mean that? Uh, if we consider Hui Larson Shalev asymptotically positive result, then we cannot drop the assumption that the rank is large enough because, say, uh, we can choose A to be some small conjugacy class and to find uh, pair, uh, the group G and the word W uh, with the width greater than two, because small conjugacy class means informally that it's clear, doesn't give you the whole group. There are many of such. So, uh, in a sense, one cannot improve the positive part of this theorem. It's naturally asymptotic if we wish to consider all possible words. At the end of uh, our story, I'll show you some uh, fabulous progress, which uh, gives something non-asymptotic, absolute theorem, but with certain restrictions on that. Let's wait for this. What else? Uh, that uh, there are small improvements of Bolwowski theorem uh, due to the same Matthew Levy, uh, who treated quasi simple and almost simple finite groups, and uh, the results are very similar in flavor. But everybody who is interested should have a look. Um, now, uh, about statement two, I uh, cheated you a little. I'm always uh, talking about Huy Larson Shalev, but in the statement I presented here, it's due to other people. Sorry for that. Huy Larson Shalev proved the real version of the theorem, and this statement is a theorem by Bob Buralnik and Fan Hutiep published in 2015. And in fact, it was a final step along the very long and complicated road paved in two earlier papers uh, published by Larson, Shalef, and Tiep several years earlier. And uh, I'll uh, tell you a short story about uh, this road to give you an impression at least um, what methods were used here. Uh, first of all, I'll talk about the first paper of Larson Shalev tube. Here, the main ingredient is the Delin list, the Delin Lustig theory of characters. I think that uh, some of you started this theory in one of preceding courses. It's one of the main achievements in the theory of finite uh, groups of the type, mm -hmm. but also uh, there are several arithmetic geometric ingredients, and they are uh, fairly advanced. 
they used several results. First of all, some analog of Chabotarev's uh, theorem and number theory. Uh, the goal is to guarantee the existence of regular semi-simple elements in the image of W. Uh, I remind you that in one of our earlier proofs, we used the existence of such regular elements. And uh, this is a very difficult fact. To prove it, the authors use some high-tech machinery I hinted when I talked about uh, the translation of group theoretic problems into the language of algebraic geometry. I told you that this is a very efficient uh, windmill that can grind everything, say, with the help of advanced technique say, left should trace formula, estimates of length, well type. So all the advanced machinery of modern arithmetic geometry was used here. So it's <clears throat> a hard theorem indeed. Yeah. It's the first paper of 2011. Then uh, uh, they prove that uh, for a given pair of words and the sufficiently large groups, there are some uh, good, some big, some simple conjugacy classes that uh, such that their product is the whole group. And uh, uh, they are inside of the images of our two words. And uh, uh, that's all. So the product of the words is subjective up to the set. Uh, well, so that's uh, uh, almost everything. So these two papers uh, made a good job, but uh, what what happens that uh, it's not enough to get the word with two. It's enough to get the word with at most three. Because uh, Lars and Shalef and Yem discovered some central elements uh, of word length three, so that need three W values. And this was a, maybe silly, but uh, uh, an obstruction that was very hard to overcome, and they were unable to do that. And that was the contribution of. Uh, uh, Guralik and Tiep. So the only thing they had to overcome uh, to treat these uh, non-central uh, uh, elements. Well, so this uh, needed a significant effort and uh, many group theoretic arguments, mainly character theory, was used. This is also very technical and very hard. Now, uh, maybe I'll uh, make a short break to ask for uh, questions. If you have any questions, please go ahead. So we talked about general words and general groups. And to sum up, the situation is negative, positive. You fix your group, your very W, you get something like Lubotsky result eventually. In the opposite direction, you fix your word, whatever word, but well, uh, with certain limitation, product of two uh, disjoint words, you vary your group, and if the group is sufficiently large, you're talking about final groups, then you get with two. So negative positive dichotomy. That's the situation here. Yeah. Well, uh, so now, uh, how can this situation be improved? We told that for general words, the situation is hopeless. Lubotsky's phenomenon prevents us from getting something for all possible words. Given G, you will always find a bad word. Bad means that its image is small. But for particular words, or more generally, for special families, good families, 
of words. One can go further, and that's what I'm going to discuss, remaining within the class of finite groups, finite simple groups. Well, um, what about special words? Here is a brief account. First of all, the most famous example, commutative word. Then we have the best possible situation. The commutator map is surjective on all finite simple groups. This was a long-standing problem, which is commonly named Ores problem because of Oystein Ore, who considered this uh, in the 50s. In fact, he considered uh, its analog for infinite simple groups, but also posed explicitly uh, the question about the surjectivity of the commutator map for all finite simple groups and mentioned that this problem should be very difficult in spite of the fact that he did not mention that in the uh, classical works of Miller and other people um, at the end of 19th century and beginning of 20th century, some cases were treated like the case of alternating groups. But anyway, it uh, took more than half a century to treat this problem up to the end. You understand that the, I am able to give even a survey of this. I mentioned the next step, uh, which was done by the same people who proved, who finished the proof of the uh, Ore conjecture. Martin Liebig, Iman O'Brien, Anar Shalef, and Fan Kutiev. After uh, very uh, important contributions of Erich Ellers and Nikolai Gordiev. And you can see the Burbaki talk by Gunter Mahle for detailed survey of this problem. This is a very particular word, and there is a non asymptotic absolute result, which uh, cannot be improved further because the estimate two for quasi-simple groups is sharp. Uh, so this is the best possible result. One can improve it going over to more general words or families of words. Uh, the second result I would like to mention that there are words that are not surjective on infinitely many finite simple groups. This is a sort of surprise because Anar Shalev uh, stated a conjecture that uh, there are no such words, that every word is uh, surjective on all but finitely many simple groups. This turned out to be wrong. And uh, there is a paper I like very much, uh, not so complicated, extremely elegant, uh, by uh, Sebastian Jimbor, Martin Liebig, and Eamon O'Brien, 2013. They considered many such words, in fact, infinite family of such bad words. Here is the simplest of them. Not so complicated, you see, but it uh, is quite impressive how uh, they managed to find such a word. It is not subjective for, on PSL2, group of Lee rank 1, for infinitely many primes. A very beautiful paper which breaks many of optimistic hopes. The next result I wanted to mention is power words. Uh, this is the topic of one of the courses in this uh, workshop, so I will not say too much. But anyway, something should be said. So first of all, for obvious reason, uh, we cannot get any general subjectivity result because, well, if the order of your group is divisible by n, then these words are identities. So, uh, well, 
Uh, how to compute the word width here? It's the main problem. We agreed that this is the width is a certain nice measure of the size of the uh, word image of the image of the word map. And here, uh, almost all results were superseded by a more or less recent paper by Bob Guralnik, Martin Libek, Iman O'Brien, Anner Shalev, and Fam Khoutiev. You see the same team in different combinations. Uh, they proved uh, some fundamental results for power words, which are to be mentioned. Uh, although they are now also superseded in certain sense, but still I want to mention their result because they show the way for right generalizations. You see, power words are not as general, a very particular family. So we consider <coughs> certain exponents. The first class of exponents uh, can be Christian Burnside numbers. They are of the form p to the power a, q to the power b, where p and q are primes, and a and b are arbitrary non-negative integers. Why do I call them Burnside? Because the famous Burnside theorem says that if n is uh, a number of this form, and if x to the power n is identically 1, then our group is solvable. In particular, in, if our group is simple, x to the power n is not identically 1, right? Well, so for this n, these five authors prove that the word map is surjective on all finite non-abelian simple groups. It's not a symptotic result. It's absolute result, but for this particular family. So the width is 2 in absolute way. 1 or 2, at most 2. The second result of a similar flavor was obtained for another class of exponents. Here n is any odd positive integers. So here I have to remind you another famous result in group theory, maybe the most famous for people outside group theory, the fight thompson theorem, which says that any group of order n of odd order is solvable. One of the most long proofs in group theory, which is now verified by computer, computer-based arguments, uh, so, in particular, x to the power n is, uh, if it is an identity, then our group is solvable. Well, and uh, for such exponents, the five authors prove that the uh, word width is at most three for all finite even cause simple groups. So very strong results. Moreover, uh, so here I mentioned that they are analogs of the Burnside and Fight Thompson theorem. And moreover, uh, they are not asymptotic, as I told you, and they are sharp. And the current examples are not that hard. So first of all, uh, the Burnside primes are the best possible. Say, if you consider the first non-Burnside uh, integer 60, and uh, the alternating group of uh, degree 5, then uh, the theorem break down. So it's written here that even non-central elements do not belong to the image of x to the n, y to the n. Here is an explicit example. You can look at the original paper. And uh, 
if we consider odd integers, then you cannot reduce a width 3 to width 2. Uh, also, current examples do not lie too far away. They appear among SL2 and G2. Uh, so, there are many other interesting results in this long paper published in Inventiones. But I would like to tell you about something which is not yet published, the most recent generalization, which in my opinion is spectacular indeed. Say, uh, it's a theorem which is a recent preprint of this year, obtained by Larson, Shalev, Tiev, that Suppose that W is not an identity of any non-abelian finite simple group. So you see the relation with the formal theorem, say, uh, the words considered in the theorem of the five offers were of this type. Yeah? So for any word of such a form, in fact, this condition is not hard to check as one could think. You do not need to check all finite non-abelian finite simple groups. To check that some word is not an identity, it's enough to consider a much shorter list of minimal non-abelian finite simple groups, which was obtained by John Thompson well before the classification of finite simple groups was finished. It doesn't use the full strength of classification. And this is a relatively short list. So suppose that W is such a word, sufficiently good one, I could say, then the W width of any non-abelian finite simple group is at most six. And uh, in the same paper, they provide many concrete families where this can be improved and replace six by four, sometimes to three, whatever. Uh, this paper is strongly recommended. It's one of the most recent spectacular achievements. Um, so uh, one cannot improve this theorem more, in a sense, because in the same paper by Guralnik Tiepov and Kasabov Nikolov, I already quoted these papers. There are negative results. Once again, some positive negative dichotomy. So fix some n, some integer, then you can find a word in the group such that W is not an identity, but its width is greater than n. So you cannot expect bounded width in such a general setup. So in a sense, so the larson shalev tf theorem of this year is best possible. You cannot get a uniform absolute result if you consider width as a measure of the size of the word map. Yeah. So this is the end of the story about word uh, maps on finite groups. It's one the first half of our lecture. So it's a good time to take a brief. And uh, uh, before going over, maybe you have some questions. So this is the state of the art for me. It's, uh, in a sense, uh, well, for me, personally, maybe this theorem finishes uh, the most important part of the story about finite groups of Lie types. Uh, there are things to improve here and there, but uh, I think that uh, this is the main well stone in the foundation of the future uh, general building of the theory of word maps on finite uh, simple groups. Uh, this can be improved a little, this should be improved a little, but uh, it's a really fundamental 
contribution. Well, so uh, I re return to the beginning of our today lecture, and I told you that uh, there are two cases, finite fields and infinite fields. Yeah. So we are about to go over the split groups, as we agreed, but over infinite fields. What can be done here? Also, using the same approach of width. Well, uh, yeah. Are there results for uh, uh, other groups other than simple groups, finite simple groups? Uh, excuse me, say it again, please. Uh, other than finite simple groups, I mean, if you look at some more general uh, groups, are there some mm. results? Uh, can mm. one say something? Well, I, uh, it's a good question. You know, uh, I intentionally limited my attention to simple groups. Well, of course, there are works. I know uh, many interesting works for other groups uh, over finite fields, uh, say, for unit triangular groups, uh, uh, there is a, a series of print by Bank of Indian School, uh, where there are many precise results, which are, of course, interesting in other sense. But if I want to have a large image, I think I uh, have to restrict attention to simple groups or to quasi-simple groups. Once again, of course, if we are interested in other questions, which are not less interesting, in distribution results or in a more explicit description of the image, of course, uh, it, it might be interesting. So you should forget about your hope to get a really large image, but this doesn't prevent you from asking about precise description of the image. In such a case, of course, you can and you should consider other uh, finite groups of lead type, and that's what people are doing, of course. Yeah, you are right. Uh, I intentionally limited my attention to simple case because uh, I was interested in results about the size of the image, trying to make it as large as possible. So, outside the class of simple groups or almost simple or quasi simple, there is no hope to do that. That's why I told was what I told. Okay. Thank you. Well, so now, so let's go further for in, for the infinite base field. So now, uh, theorem due to uh, Huy Larson Schleff, the same paper I quoted, another part of this paper. Um, so, um, what uh, did they prove? So, the setup uh, is written here. In a sense, uh, all items of this theorem are of similar flavor. That under certain assumptions, you get a relatively small width. In general, for any simply connected split group over any infinite field, so you see a setup is very general. You get the width four, as in the first item. Sometimes one can improve this. And uh, uh, you can get a little more, say you can get three for SLM. And I will tell something uh, more recent in a few minutes. And if you specialize even more, if you consider some special fields which contain either the real field or the etic field, otherwise a local field, then you can get with two. So it's uh, a very uh, impressive 
achievement. So you see, in such a generality, Kui Larson and Shelev got a very uh, nice result about the wheat. Uh, I'm not going to discuss the proof. Uh, it, you, you should look at the original paper or once again to our survey with Bardzeev and Plotkin. And uh, one remark here is that case two was improved. See, uh, in fact, it was improved to all cases from SLM, which was the contribution of uh, Hui Larson and Shelet, to all groups except for B2 and G2. Uh, it's a work of Nikolai Gordiev with uh, his PhD student, uh, Alexa Yegorchenkova. And uh, in a subsequent paper, she showed, Yegorchenkova showed that in the remaining cases, uh, that she did not succeed to go up to the end, but she proved that the image covers almost everything. So it covers the so-called large Brewer cell, if you consider the Brewer decomposition. In the groups of this type, there is a thing which is called the large Brewer cell, BWB, when W is a coaster element, then it's this large cell is contained in the image of the map. So the width is almost three in a sense. Yeah. And uh, another contribution which was uh, written down in our joint paper with Gordiev and Plotkin that the nice case three where the width is two can be slightly extended from fields containing local fields to all quadratic Alameda fields K. I remind you that this is a field which contains only finitely many quadratic extensions. We discussed them in one of our earlier lectures. Well, that's uh, all. In fact, what can I say, what I can say about this setup, simple split algebraic groups over finite or infinite fields. What can we do in the, on the road of generalization? I told you that uh, all the time we considered with maps on semi-simple algebraic groups. And we noticed that it's not possible to move too far beyond. Once again, in the same sense I told Tony Park a few minutes ago, if we insist on having a large uh, image, if we do insist on that, then what we succeeded to do, only a small step beyond this class, we managed to treat certain perfect groups. That's what I want to tell you uh, in brief. So perfect groups are groups which coincide with commutator subgroups. And we consider algebraically closed field of characteristic zero. Think about complex field. We consider a perfect group. We identify it with groups with its group of points. We denote by U the unipotent radical. And then it is known that the quotient is a semi-simple algebraic group. Uh, then we use the famous Mostov's theorem. Well, Mostov's theorem uh, surprisingly uh, is not so easy to find a good quote for this theorem. Either you should look at the original paper of Mostov or there is a not so popular textbook by Hochschild or there is a, a nice paper by Brian Conrad which uh, cons considers the situation is much bigger generality of group schemes. But anyway, this theorem says that in this setup, there is a complement, which is called the Levy subgroup. Uh, the situation parallel to the famous theorem of Maltsev, fully algebras, that there exists a closed linear algebraic subgroup H of G. 
is isomorphic to this quotient. Or equivalently, one can formulate that uh, G is a semi-direct product in such a case. Uh, so H is called a Levy subgroup, and we uh, uh, fix one of them. They all conjugate. This is another theorem. This is to be proven. But anyway, uh, this is true. Now uh, we consider this unipotent radical, U. We consider the low central series of this unipotent radical. It uh, is finite. We denote by VI the consecutive quotients. And uh, here we can view this quotient as a H modules, or more precisely, K of H modules over the group or ring of H. Why so? Because we are in characteristic zero. You should be careful in characteristic P. In characteristic P, everything is, uh, breaks down. All this, most of theory and Levy subgroups, everything breaks down. But here in characteristic zero, we can say more what is said here, that uh, we have a linear action of H on VI. Why so? Because we are just fine spaces, just vector spaces. And the conjugation action uh, becomes key linear action. This is a small theorem to be proved. And we use this linear action to introduce the following definitions. We say that a representation of a module M is augmentative if it has no quotients on which H acts trivially. So it's, in a sense, morally it's in the composable. Well, fixed point free maybe it's uh, an appropriate uh, um, informal terminology. Now, if G is perfect, then it is known, it's a theorem by Gordiev and Saxel, that the first quotient, V1, is augmentative. It's a non-trivial thing. And then we say that our group is firm if for every i uh, this quotient is augmentative. So um, almost never you have fixed point. And this sometimes holds and sometimes not. For instance, there is an important class of groups where this holds if um, U is a billion. The unipotent radical is small, so to speak. Then any perfect group is firm. So it's a non-trivial class of perfect groups, not so large, but anyway, it exists. And we say that G is strictly firm if for every I this VI has no non-zero T invariant vectors. So not only uh, H invariant, H is a reductive group, but T is a maximal torus, it's a smaller group. So we require something more strong, that uh, even less invariant vectors. And uh, what uh, can be done for such groups? that we have a sort of analog of Borel's dominance theorem, which is proved in our uh, 2018 paper with Gordiev and Plotkin, published in International Journal of Algebra and Computation. First, if our group is strictly firm, then our map is dominant, the best possible uh, analog of Borel's theorem. If it is firm, then say the dominance width is two, in a sense, not a real width because we cannot prove surjectivity. Never can we prove this surjectivity. We can only prove the dominance. Sorry. Uh, uh, and. Uh, um, the question remains open. So 
We do not know any non-trivial current example where uh, we don't know whether there exists a connecting, a connected uh, perfect group such that the corresponding word map is not dominant. It would be interesting to know um, the answer, but we are not aware of it. Uh, this problem does not seem for me terribly difficult, so this should be doable, but one has to go more deep inside the theory of perfect algebraic groups, which is not so well developed to my surprise. Then another direction, which is uh, also very well challenging and very inspiring. I, I want to come back to the beginning of our lecture course. And I told you that we consider word equations with uh, right hand side fixed. And on the left hand side, we did not allow ourselves any constants. Yeah, so we considered only this setup. We consider a word as an element of a free group. We fix some element of our group and we study the evaluation map. So this was our setup during all our work. Yeah. Now I want to be a little more flexible. I want to extend borders and to allow constants also on the left hand side. Let me be more precise. So now I consider the free product of the free group by our group G. What does it mean? Uh, I, uh, what's free product? So you uh, consider expressions of the form where between letters, letters are elements of our free group, say X, Y, Z, whatever, X1, X2, XD, maybe raised to the sum power, you can insert some constants, some elements of our fixed group G. Uh, and to every such word with constants that I denote by W sub sigma, sigma is a collection of elements of our group G, I also can associate some word map. Once again, evaluation. The collection sigma of constants is fixed. Then I take a d-tuple of elements of G. I perform all uh, uh, operations in our group, raising to the powers, multiplication by constants, multiplication inside our group. And at the end of the story, I arrive at some element of G. So it's again some map. Of course, not a homomorphism, but you get some generalization of word maps, and you can ask the same uh, questions about the subjectivity, dominance, size of the image, whatever. So here is our equation, as I explained to you, and we can pose the same questions as those discussed uh, earlier. Yeah. Well, and uh, uh, why is this interesting? Of course, it's a natural question and it's all right. Uh, because um, I do not want to discuss this further, but it's related to some classical uh, group theoretic problems. For instance, Thompson conjecture. What's Thompson conjecture? I remind you, one of most challenging conjectures in uh, the theory of in group theory, certain generalization of Ora's conjecture. You ask whether a given group contains a conjugacy class whose square gives you the whole group. Yeah? Um, 
It can be fit inside this setup of words with constants. Your word is conjugation, and uh, you want to consider the word width, say, if you know that it is uh, at most two, you get Thompson's conjecture. And also some generalization of Thompson's conjecture, so-called cover numbers. Uh, but also uh, the interest to this uh, setup is related to application for treating genuine word equations, as I mentioned um, last Sunday when we talked about Gnutov and Gordiev, who applied this technique for producing recursive sequences of uh, surjective words on PSL2C. The proofs that I omitted are based on word maps with constants. So if some of you will try to analyze their proof, they will have to understand this setup. Well, so uh, let's uh, just uh, to recall that we limit ourselves to considering equations in groups, but not all the groups. Why so? Because many people consider word equations with constants, but they treat equations over groups. The difference is that they allow themselves to look for solutions in some over group of our given group G. We do not allow this uh, to us. Yeah. Now some terminology to quote some interesting results. So we denote by E the augmentation map. What's that? All constants are sent to one. And then you perform all operations, some consolation uh, some consolations in our word may happen, and uh, starting from some very complicated word with constants, after the augmentation, <coughs> you can get even a uh, trivial word, yeah? Eventually, everything can cancel. Uh, so, words where you get trivial word are called singular, and usually people consider non-singular words. So here are several facts which are dispersed in a sense. Uh, there are not too many facts that are known to me. I quote three results. The first is a very old one, more than half a century ago. Consider the unitary group, uh, power words with constants in a sense. So only one letter X, but with between different powers of x, you are allowed to insert unitary matrices. Yes, yeah? sort of new setup. And then it turns out that any such map is surjective. Uh, surprising. And the proof is surprisingly beautiful and short, in fact. And I'll say a few words about that. Then the second result is more recent, due to Anton Klitschko and Andreas Stone. They consider a special unitary group with P prime, uh, word in two letters. Then uh, this uh, augmentation map uh, is required to be not too deep image. So the image is not too deep. It's inside the so-called uh, second uh, exponent P central subgroup. It's some technical assumption, but which is important in their proof. Then once again, for any sigma, for any collection of constants, then the word is surjective. A result of the same spirit and now uh, our result with Gordiev and Plotkin, which is a different spirit. You consider any non-singular word and any general collection of constants in the sense I don't want to make precise. And uh, the conclusion is uh, weaker. We cannot prove the surjectivity, but we prove dominance. But anyway, uh, 
a nice result. Or algebraically closed field, everything. Let me just mention that the methods are very different. The first result relies on the homotopic um, geometry, I could say, the classical Hopf degree theorem that says that you can distinguish uh, the homotopical class of manifold looking by looking at some numerical invariant, which is called the Hopf degree. Uh, the second is also of topological nature, but needs some much more advanced technique, some advanced homological algebra. And uh, our result is <coughs> algebraic geometric. Let me skip details here. We are approaching the end of our story. So the question, of course, is how far can one hope to go further for words with constants? Well, I'm looking, being a non-expert in topology, I leave aside the first two results. It's fascinating, but not for me because of my ignorance in the homotopic topology and the algebraic topology. Uh, see, uh, here, if we want to look at all possible words, then there are obvious limitations. Because here, in contrast with genuine words, even on simple groups, there are words with constants, so-called group identities with constants. And you can look at the paper of Gardzeev, who studied these words form simple algebraic groups. So you have to exclude this. This is the first thing to be excluded. And uh, this is an important limitation, inevitable one. The second thing you uh, should take into account that there are very important words like this, conjugation by a constant. So our collection sigma consists of one element, small sigma. You consider conjugation and you consider the corresponding map. Then, of course, all elements in the image are conjugate. So your image consists of a single conjugacy class and it cannot be too large. After all, it's a single conjugacy class, you see? Another limitation. So the most optimistic hope is to show that these are the only possible limitation. It's not so obvious how to formalize this hope, and we formalized it as follows. Let me quote one of our conjectures which is challenging enough. In our paper, you can look at the details. So we consider, first of all, the quotient map from G to the quotient of the maximal torus by the Weyl group. It's the so-called Chevalier quotient map. It is started in a fundamental paper by Springer and Steinberg, for instance. And we consider the composed map, the word map composed with this quotient map. And uh, uh, one can prove that once we know that this composed map is dominant, then uh, the uh, conjugation word map is dominant too. Yeah? So, this is a sort of dominance after conjugacy. So this means that almost all conjugacy classes, except of some closed subset, intersect the image of the word map. That's the most optimistic fact one could prove. But unfortunately, we cannot prove this. And uh, this is uh, the precise statement of this dichotomy. So we hope that this question can be answered in the affirmative, that the image of this composed map is either just one point, the total collapse. So this 
happens for uh, identities with constants for every sigma or for a dense subset in this quotient t over w then for any collection of constants from some non-empty open subsets uh, the uh, it is dense so that's i christianed dominance uh, up to conjugacy that's uh, the setup we produced, but nothing beyond that. So before the last 15 minutes, let me also stop for a while. If you have any questions so far. I don't know um, to what extent this problem is uh, uh, difficult or not so difficult any anyway uh, the words with constants are poorly started I think so and they certainly deserve to be studied more and maybe a right way though time consuming and labor consuming is to try not to limit oneself by algebraic geometry but also try to understand topological approaches due to classics and uh, also due to Klitschko and Tom. They um, wrote uh, several more interesting papers on the topic. So maybe a combination of the two approaches would be helpful. Anyway, um, this is a kind of uh, interesting generalization for me. Uh, what else? Uh, the rest of the talk will be uh, de devoted to some miscellaneous eventual applications and open problems. The first one uh, will be mentioned very briefly. I, all the time I was talking about the image of the a word map or in simple words about the solvability of the word equations. So one can ask about the structure of the set of the equation of this fixed equation or one can try the very right hand side and to study the behavior of the fibers of word maps. This is a sort of equidistribution problems. Also, they can be studied for finite ground field and for infinite ground field. And for finite ground field, there are many interesting results. You can see a survey of Anar Sharlev in the collection uh, dedicated to the uh, 100th century uh, anniversary of Erdush. And uh, there are many interesting generalizations. There are generalization for profiling groups, residually finding groups, whatever. There are probabilistic results. Many fascinating results are available for finite groups or close to them. And the case of infinite ground fields is almost totally unexplored. Also, you can study fibers and you can try to formulate a sort of equidistribution results, but I'm not aware of anything in this direction. Now, one for people interested in arithmetic, you can consider number fields as your ground field. You can consider the algebraic varieties arising from the equations we considered. And you can ask typical questions about local to global results, Hasse principle, weak approximation. Hasse principle means that, uh, is it true that whenever this equation is locally solvable so for all basic completions, is it true that this implies that the equation is solvable globally over Q? And even the simplest case is non-trivial, where you can see this in two, and the commutator word, this is a topic of our ongoing joint work with Tatiana Bachman. She and I are working on that for several years, but still 
uh, something is done, hopefully the preprint will appear at some point, but there are many technical problems here, both from geometric and from arithmetic side, and from arithmetic geometric side, I could say. Uh, maybe the last topic for this course uh, go, takes us to the beginning of our uh, series of lectures. I told you that one of my main conceptual goals is to understand some relationship which eventually exists between word equations in groups and polynomial equations in associative algebras and also in Lie algebras. So what's known here? I'll give you a very brief account. We consider the equations of this form. So P is a polynomial in D variables, but it is non-commutative polynomial. Associative, but not commutative. Yeah? And A is an element of some associative K algebra, script A. And the questions are the same. Is any such equation solvable? How is it solvable for a generic or random A, whatever? So you can reformulate everything in the language of polynomial maps and ask about the surjectivity or dominance. Yeah. And, uh, well, <coughs> most results are known for the case of matrix algebra, which is already highly non-trivial. And most of them uh, belong to my colleagues, Alexei Kanel-Belov, Sergei Balev, and Louis Rowan, uh, mostly during these years. There are also more recent results by Sergei Malev, and there are extensions to non-associative polynomials, non-commutative and non-associative, and non-associative algebra, which are uh, completely beyond the scope of these lectures. So, first of all, what should be remarked? That to ask a meaningful question, one has to assume that the polynomial is not identically zero. We already know that such polynomials do exist, Rasmuslov polynomial. And moreover, that it is not central, that not all of its values are scalar matrices. Uh, such polynomials, as I told you, were discovered by the same Yuri Rasmuslov and also by Eduard Formanek. Two chess masters, as I told International masters. Chess players are very high international level. Perhaps this helps. If you look at, once again, I recommend you to look at these old original works of them and you will understand how strong should one be in counting in some, making some local calculations to discover such polynomials. So we have to assume that our polynomial is not identically zero and not central. Under these assumptions, something can be proved, but also the results are much weaker. So, uh, first of all, there are two different situations. Either the image contains at least one matrix with non-zero trace, or it consists of traceless matrices. More precisely, some people hate this terminology, traceless, and say that matrix with zero trace is not traceless, but I mean zero trace. And the second case concerns, for instance, when we have a Lie polynomial, a case we already discussed. And here is an account. We assume that P is not central. For simplicity, the ground field is either real or complex. The first striking negative results that regardless of the topology, the risky complex real, there are polynomials whose image is not dense. So no ground for all optimistic results. But for multilinear polynomials, such examples are not known. 
So one has to restrict one's optimism to looking at multilinear polynomials, and there is a conjecture due to Kaplansky and Lvov, which asserts that in this case the image is large. It is either the whole matrix algebra or the algebra of trace zero matrices, which I denote by S. There are many results in these directions, in this direction, but the question in general is still open. And it would be interesting to understand the eventual gaps between real and complex case and uh, regarding different topologies. Here is the set of questions. First of all, can one observe the subjectivity over R but not over C? I don't know. Then, uh, can one observe the risky density but not Euclidean density? I do not know. Over C, but look, over R, there is a gap. Look at squaring, and one can prove. Look at one of recent papers of Malev, or say return to the beginning of our course, where uh, our first example with this squaring map. Here, one can easily prove that the image is a risky dense, but not dense in Euclidean topology. A hint: look at the determinant. It takes only non-negative values, yeah, so it cannot be dense in Euclidean topology. To finish, let me turn you to the picture from the beginning of our course. So my goal was to build a bridge between several different theories. Equations in algebraic groups, equations in matrix algebras as associative algebras, equations in Lie algebras. And I tried to use all style bridge. In fact, this is my favorite one. It's not accidental. It's the bridge that I could observe being a young child from my window in my home city. At the time, this was the longest bridge in Europe. It's no longer the case, of course, but this is a good old style bridge. And, you know, old style things, I could say that eventually they probably do not work. So, altogether, if we take a sober view on all the story I told you, not that is it complete failure, but the bridges are far from being built. And for me, this means that one should look for much more complicated and advanced technique to build new style bridge, which can be illustrated roughly by this much more recent bridge, which is constructed very far from my uh, the birthplace. Uh, it's in southern China, if I'm not mistaken. You see how it looks, compare it with the old style one, and perhaps this is a model of the activity which one has to uh, develop towards uh, the construction of new bridge, which would eventually lead to new understanding. So let me finish here. Many thanks for you thank you very much. Uh, it was a really interesting lecture. Uh, let's uh, thank Professor Kuniawski for his uh, uh, beautiful lectures. Uh, if anybody has any question, yeah, you can ask any question. Get questions now. I'm happy to get questions now. Later, maybe after somebody will go more deeply in. Uh, this right. topic. I'm pretty open for discussing this question further. And good luck in your mathematical career. It was Thank very you. nice to uh, see interest to this course.
And um, bye for now. Thank you, Anupam, for nice uh, organization work. Um, yeah. And yeah. thank you to thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah. We will continue by correspondence. And eventually, sure, yeah. eventually maybe you will um, make another visit to our place. When, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, same to you, if you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, uh, we can well, also plan. Hopefully, okay, let's get hope. better. Let's hope. Uh, bye for now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.